So the theme for this week is a very broad theme, and it is intellect, personality, ego. Those things are sort of classified as the same, and we'll cover that today. But just to make sure you don't get confused uh, with ego, ego is a tricky word, so I've lumped them together. Intellect, personality, and ego, and consciousness and leadership. So these are two areas of study that are very important to a spiritual practitioner, a meditator, and we'll explore that a little bit uh, in the discourse this morning. So we live in a time where there is a, a conflict of intellect. You know, there's a lot of emphasis placed on the intellect. And when I say intellect, I mean the need to be right, the attitude of I'm right and you're wrong, or how we assess people based on their benchmarks of achievement. We know that's true because when you meet a new person, what's the first thing they do when they meet you? They ask you what? What you do for work, exactly. So there's some way of evaluating the surface of a person. You know, Bob Marley used to always say, you see the face of a man, but you can't see their heart. And the problem is, if you just see the face, you miss the point. You know? It's not saying you don't have a job. That would be absurd. You're a householder. You have a job, but it doesn't define you. And if you know who you are and you have a job based on who you are, your quality of life will be better. But if you just have a job, that's yeah, not too bad, I guess. It's like a six out of ten. Could be worse. <laughs> you know. So you get the idea of the intellect. And when we make these benchmarks of achievement, the primary focus of our reality, it reinforces the nature of duality, which the sages of the past said, the yogi is able to move beyond duality. So if we put all of our emphasis on the, you know, the throne of the intellect, it reinforces the nature of duality, which the yogi is interested on in going beyond that. Okay. And consciousness, reinforces the experience of, instead of duality, unity, meaning oneness. And we need both. So I want to be clear, I'm not saying let's completely deny the intellect and get rid of it. I'm not saying that at all. It's the same way as the body in yoga. You know, it says the yogi is not attached to the physical vessel. But that doesn't mean that you don't care about your body. You do care about your body. You just recognize that it's not who you are. Same with the intellect. According to Carl Jung, the intellect is even denser than the body. So this right, wrong, good, bad, love, fear is even denser than your bones and skin. It's very quantifiable duality. If I showed you a picture of you know, black and white, everybody could agree what was what. It's very dense and tangible. And there are components of the body that aren't so dense and tangible. You know, like there's a million functions happening right now in your body that I can't see and that you're not even conscious of. Right? You know, blood cells going through in single file through the veins, whatever, through the capillaries. And so if the language of the intellect is the need to be right, I am right, you are wrong, what is the language of consciousness? Well, in the sentence, need to be right, what would be the language of consciousness? Think of Shakespeare. To be, that's the language of consciousness. Or in the sentence, I am right, what is the language of consciousness? I am. There's no duality. There's only one. Or you are wrong, you know, we would take that in place. We are would be the language of consciousness. And the yogi is interested in that. But without denying the intellect, you know, we, a lot of yogis have very sharp intellect. You develop the intellect the same way you develop the body. You become a master of the intellect. You become a master of the body. But you're expanding out through this density from a place of knowing or consciousness. That's a yogi, somebody who practices yoga, the experience of oneness, seeing the one in all, in all density, even density that appears to be separate from you, like
like you guys seem to be like you're over there and I'm over here. Really, at the base of what we are as humans is carbon. We're all made of the same thing. You know, but it would be absurd for us to just say, oh, well, we're all just one. And so let's just ignore any form of individuality or uniqueness. I mean, that would be absurd. It would be insane. And some people have experiences like that. You read about them, these awakenings, where they think that everything is one around them, and they, it's like insanity. The great thing about what Yogi Bhajan gave with Kundalini Yoga is he provided a container for you to experience that safely. I shared this example last week about drug use. Like A lot of people take psychedelic drugs to have an experience of an awakened consciousness where you experience the oneness. You know, but I had one friend who had taken a bunch of psychedelic mushrooms when I was younger, and we were all, you know, at one with the universe and having this incredible experience. And then at some point in the evening, he said, I'm going upstairs to my room by himself. And we were all like, don't do it, man. <laughs> and he went up to the room by himself, and we didn't see him again until the next day. And to this day, he's never done drugs again, not even once. I'm not sure what happened in that room, but there was a deep experience <laughs> of oneness that was too much for the individual to contain. <laughs> you understand, right? So the beautiful thing about some of these practices is it gives you a container where you can sort of like gradually pull the, the shades open rather than just like, shh. And you're like, whoa! <laughs> you understand, huh? Because really, like the drugs, the drugs aren't really doing anything. They're getting in touch with you, in touch with something that's already there consciousness, who you are. So there's more effective ways to do it. You could try that if you want. I mean, I experimented with that a lot. I wouldn't be sitting here if it wasn't for that, but I'm not recommending it. This is more sustainable. You know, it's a lot easier for me to get up and practice and take my daughter to school through the practice of Kundalini Yoga and meditation than it would be for me to wake up every morning and take psilocybin. Just saying. I haven't tried it, but I wouldn't recommend it. So the, when I talk about the intellect, I want to say that it's like the intellect combined with ego, but not ego by itself. Ego by itself is neutral. So we hear a lot of old school spiritual writings about how you're supposed to get rid of the ego. It's incorrect. It's impossible. It's talking about creating a healthy relationship with the ego. So if it's all intellect and ego, that moves you into the realm of duality, where you're superior to others or inferior to others. That's duality, right? So that's an unhealthy relationship with the ego. Because there's no consciousness in it. Does that make sense? If you place consciousness into the experience of the ego, then you recognize how incredibly amazing you are, and you also see the same potential in others. And in doing so, you don't feel less than anybody. How could you be? You're born with infinite value. That's an ego that's balanced. So you're not trying to get rid of ego. What I'm talking about in the negative context of the ego is when the intellect and the ego are working together with no relationship to consciousness. This is a superiority conflict, uh, complex or inferiority complex, the ego problem. Make sense? So we kind of have to lump personality, intellect, ego all together so that it's clear. And this deals with uh, externals. So it emphasizes a sense of individuality, boundaries, comparisons, out of balance that creates uh, ego problems. And that has led to things like industrial capitalism or a live for profit mentality. This sort of thing's out of balance. What do I get out of it? How can I benefit? I don't really care about anybody else, you know? You know how many animals are killed for food in a year on the planet? 70 billion is insane. Well, I just need it for my, like, 70 billion? I won't be taking part in anything that takes the lives of 70 billion living things. 
And my daughter asked me like, oh, well, a plant is living. And I said, think about it this way. If you put a chicken in the ground, will a chicken sprout up? No. She said, well, I don't need anything that, you know, if I put an avocado seed in the ground and an avocado pops up, I'll eat it. You know, but 70 billion industrial capitalism. And I'm not, you know, lumping the small farmer into this. I'm talking about industrial capitalism that is just like scorching the earth with no regard for life. That's the big enemy here and everything else. Once we get rid of the industrial capitalism, we can talk about, you know, things have been practiced for generations. That's not the enemy. The enemy is we don't give a fuck and we're going to do it on a huge scale. That's dangerous. You know? So those things like a sense of individuality, boundaries, comparisons, uh, those, there's a healthy relationship with those that takes place as well. I want to be clear about that. Like you have a uniqueness. You are able to be creative. You need boundaries. That's a healthy relationship to the intellect. Don't you need boundaries? You know? And also I want to be clear about another thing is there's such a thing as healthy competition and there's such a thing as conscious capitalism, right? And you'll sort of see that as we go through this. So it's not like I'm saying, well, we shouldn't earn any money, or that's not what I'm saying here. I'm talking about where you don't care about anything else but your own gains. That's a problem, right? And if everything's only happening on the external, there's too much structure going on, and it causes an issue with the space inside of the structure. Meaning, like, if you have too many boundaries, you may miss out on life. Right? Or if you only see the surface, you see a person's face and not the heart. Now, at the same time, if you had only space, like we were talking about, we're all just carbon. If we only see that and we don't have any boundaries, it's like uh, all there is is like the blurry magma of life. There's no separation whatsoever. There needs to be some. That's what makes me me, and I get to live out my life, and you get to live out yours, and there's room for each of us to be that. So you're not trying to get rid of the ego. You're just learning to operate it effectively. Same with the body. Imagine a car. What makes you attracted to a car? You need a car. It's function. Some people like the way it looks. Some people like the brand of the car. Some people, you know, there's a lot of different ideas about it. I drove a big black truck to get here to bring a dresser home from White Rock. I could get used to driving that. Put my hair in some nice Willie Nelson braids and just enjoy, put like old country music. Like I could just feel myself easing into like, maybe we should get a truck. <laughs> <laughs> you know. But the intellect or the, um, even the body like in yoga, the body is like the rubber on the tires. You can't get rid of it, you know. Imagine me driving in the Dodge Ram truck, big black truck, just on the rims down the road. It would change the experience. <laughs> right? You know. But at the same time, the whole reason why I'm enjoying this truck is all these elements. The music is nice. The ride is nice. The truck is really sturdy. There's enough space to store some things. There's all these components of the truck. I don't go wow, I really love the rubber on the tires of these tr this truck. This is you know, what appeals to me. It's insane. You see what I mean, huh? It's necessary. The intellect is necessary. The body is necessary. You have to put air in the tires, take care of it, and then the truck will function. You know? and, and how you do that is up to you. Make sense? So you're not trying to get rid of it. But if you let the intellect take over this right, wrong, good, bad, yada, 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 fear prevails. Right? If enough I'm right and you're wrong goes on, what happens? 
eventually we'll become fearful, the need to protect, blame, all of that stuff. Is that happening in the world today? Yeah. And if that happens, then you lose touch with your creative essence. You experience isolation. You feel separate from others. That's duality, separateness. You know what the Buddha called separateness? Maya. What does it mean? It's an illusion. It doesn't exist. It's a product of the mind. It's a product of thought. I'm this and you're that. I'm a boy and you're a girl. I'm a Christian, you're a Jew. I'm blah, you know, blah, 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 blah. On and on and on and on. It's a fabrication of the mind. And we can tell this even from gender. There's all these studies about gender. It's a uh, social construct. The baby isn't born going, uh, and now I'm going to do all the boy things. It's learned. Right? It's duality. It's learned. It's a product of thought. And then you, from that place, this experience of isolation, you feel the need to prove or validate. And that's a hard life. And then consciousness, your true nature, the true self that you're born with, it's not influenced by thought and emotion. It just is. That's why we say, I am. Consciousness is interested in that. It's not influenced by thought and emotion. And you even hear that sentence and the intellect goes, hold on, wait a minute here. You're trying to say I'm not important. <laughs> Well, you sort of are, but you're just the rubber on the tire, so keep it down. You're important. We need you. But you're not the star of the show. It's a safe guide through the third and fourth dimension. What's a third dimension? Time. And what's a fourth dimension? Space. It's a safe guide through time and space. So you can see who you are in relationship to time and space. If you think that all you are is time and space, that's where the sentence or the saying, time is money, comes from. You think you're only time and space. You're not only time and space. Here's a good example of it. This guy here sitting on the altar lived 300 years ago. 400 probably years ago. He's an influence in my practice on a daily basis. He's completely gone. He's not living in time. He's not living in space. He doesn't have a physical body. How can I be influenced by that? Logically, it doesn't make sense. Can't be measured. I, like, how could I measure the influence that Guru Ram Das has on my life? Subtle. But his connection to consciousness is what allows him to be carried forward. The same way if somebody believes too much in time and space, they can create a legacy based on that. Like a negative, I'm right and you're wrong. Hitler or something like that. But it's not just time and space. There's more to it than that. There has to be. Or think about a mother's love. Can you measure a mother's love? How much does it weigh? You can't measure it, but we can all agree that it exists, right? It's beyond the third and fourth dimension. It's connected to consciousness, fifth and beyond. That's what the yogi is interested in. If you think you're just time and space, that's where you the fear of death comes from. This is the end of this time and space. But is it? No. The intellect will tell you it is. This is it, man. And the great yogis, they talk about the time of death being mahasamadhi. You know what that means? It doesn't mean fear it. What does it mean? The big bliss. <laughs> like, woo, not, oh shit, no. Some deeper understanding going on there. Try and keep my language uh, 
Oh, don't worry. Oh, dude. <laughs> Mar Marley said, like, said some things recently where we're like, where did you hear that? She's like, you. Like, Fair enough. <laughs> But time and space doesn't have to define you or the quality of your life. You know? Like Yogi Bhajan talked a lot about security. Security can't be defined by how much money you have. There are many people who don't have any things who are very secure. There's a lot of people who have many things that are insecure. There are a lot of people who have many things who are secure. See what I'm saying? What does that mean? Secure. Security. They know who they are in relationship to their time and space. You know, like uh, Ramana Maharishi, when he got sick and all the devotees were weeping, and he was sort of, I'm paraphrasing, but he said, you dummies, like, didn't I teach you anything? I'm not sick. The body is just going to become something else. It's the way nature works. And where will your consciousness know, go? I don't know. Let's find out. It's exciting, you know, not time to cry. This is stuff is, by the way, is really easy to talk about in theory and then in practice. It's you know, late at night while you're thinking, what if I die? There's all <laughs> these, you know. It's not like, woo, all right, off to sleep. So easy to talk about it. So that what I'm trying to get at here is if you create a relationship with your consciousness, you can expand out through the ego, through the intellect, through the personality. And that by becoming aware of who you are, you create a consistent relationship with Dharma or Tao. And that means the way of you, not the way of Buddha, not the way of Shiva, not the way of Mother Teresa, not the way of whatever, whoever. It's the way of you. You get in touch with your consciousness, who you are, and you expand out through the surface. That creates a consistent relationship with Dharma, like Dharma Temple, where you are now. This is a process of uncovering who you are and living as that. And some of those other people that I mentioned, they may inspire you. But your goal is not to be like them. Your goal is to be you. <laughs> and if you do that, you can be even greater than them. Again, easy to talk about. I understand that. Think about it this way. Consciousness is your voice. The ego, the intellect, the personality is the projection of your voice. See the difference between the two? If you don't know your voice and you just project your voice, what does it sound like? Noise. Right? Like when a baby is learning how to use the pipes, what does it sound like? It's not. You can't tell who they are. You may be able to tell their relationship to time and space. They're hungry. They need their diaper change. They need, you know. But they, you watch. When they're a newborn baby, they don't know how to project their voice too much. And then something switches, and they're like, bleh, like really loud. <laughs> they're learning about projection. But as you move through life, you start to uncover who you are. Who you are, your voice, your consciousness. And if you know who you are and you know how to project, that's mastery. And if you're not sure who you are and you know how to project, what's that? Chaos. This complete confusion. It's, I'm right and you're wrong and you did this to me and blah, 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 you know, and then everybody does it together. And what do we have on our hand? A big problem. Right? So you see the difference between the two? Consciousness is your voice. The intellect, the ego, personality is the projection of your voice. Okay?
And consciousness eventually must prevail over the ego. Otherwise, you're going to come up against a lot of difficulty. Right? Have you had that experience? Have you been in a relationship, a job, some addictive patterns, an illness, or something that is really challenging you to step into who you are? It's incredibly uncomfortable. Like my uh, friend Hardy Singh, who's a cancer sur survivor, at the other end of his cancer, he said, I think that cancer is one of the best things that ever happened to me. Not because he wanted cancer. <laughs> He wouldn't pray for cancer. But the cancer came up to connect him to who he was. All of a sudden, he was more present with his family. He was more present with his spiritual uh, practice. He was more present with his students. He was more present with his business. You see what I mean, huh? It's really challenging for you to just wake up one day and have consciousness prevail over ego and intellect. Oh, I'm just going to lead from consciousness now. Do to do, do. I mean, you know, there's a process involved. We call that a yoga practice or a meditation practice. This is what Yogi Bhajan said about listening to your own voice. Once you have been given the command, you can bring it into fruition. Not being attached to roles or games or styles. You no longer need people to understand your purpose. You must know the command and have divine vision without fear, without failure, without even hope. No ego, no boundaries, no love or hate present. Serve only the command with no attachment to result or opinion. You hear it? Without even hope. That's a tricky one for the ego to grasp because of the nature of duality. But wait a minute, don't we need hope? It's a process of deep listening where what's happening on the surface doesn't matter. Because you hear your voice in relationship to all of this. Is pain going to happen in your life? No matter what, right? Whether you listen to yourself or not, right? Is joy going to happen in your life? Yeah, whether you listen to yourself or not. It's the nature of nature. It's always happening like that. So your goal is while you pass through, you're supposed to, it's part of nature, feel the highs and lows of living. And we live in this culture that says, let's find some way to only feel the highs. It's out of balance. You know, I was listening to this radio program where they were talking about uh, the insanity of pharmaceutical drugs. You know Viagra? Everybody knows Viagra. When Viagra was discovered, they were using it as a blood pressure pill. And they found out that it had a strange side effect. <laughs> you understand? But they couldn't market it just as a, here's a, something that you can buy as a supplement to improve your performance in the bedroom because it won't sell. You know what sells? Something that's to treat a condition, like for a disease or a condition. So the people who discovered this, you know who they hired? Not scientists, an ad agency to come up with a condition called erectile dysfunction, discovered by an ad agency. Perfect, we got a disease, now we can market it and sell it. Isn't that insane? <laughs> Man, when I heard that, I was like, oh my God, that is insane. So it's uh, incredibly challenging to navigate this world that we're living in, is what I'm saying. You don't know what's going on in front of you. You have to be able to see through it. Otherwise, it's like this, that, right, wrong, you know. It's a challenging world. But if you know who you are in relationship to, you'll be able to navigate that stuff. And even laugh at some of it. Oh, ha, ha, that's pretty funny. You know. Or do something about it. So this command Yogi Bhajan is talking about is like a hukum. It's a command. It's your foundation. And if you serve your command well, 
you'll be able to serve others. If you know who you are, you'll be able to serve others. If you don't know, it's not going to happen. Because basically, in my understanding, there are two paths for humans. It seems like, oh, we just said there's 7.5 billion. But each of them can filter into one of these two categories. And the first is you serve your higher self in order to serve others. And the second is you serve the intellect in order to serve the ego or personality. They all break down into one or the other. You serve your higher self in order to serve others, or you serve your ego in order to serve the intellect or personality. It all breaks down into one of those two paths. I've experienced that. I know it's very sim simplified, but try and find an exception to the rule. It's impossible. So you, you decide what you're going to do, what path you're going to walk. And you walk it as you. And a leader is someone who is personally at the service of their own higher self. You can see who you are in relationship to your conditions. Does it like that 100% of the time? No. If it was, would you need a practice? Of course not. to create a real vision of your purpose rather than the prejudice of the intellect. You know where prejudice comes from? Thought. You're not born with prejudice. It's learned. Even prejudice against you and your purpose. I even hear it in my five-year-old child already. Oh, I could never do that. Or she'll be singing a song like, la, 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 at the top of her lungs, and then she'll be like, oh, I can't do this. Five years old, being raised in a conscious household. She's being prejudiced against her own intellect as an enemy of hers at five already. Just imagine once the reinforcements come in. So you need to do something about it because you're here to be you freely, not to be right or better than so-and-so. And this practice that we're going to do today and that we do every day is to clear the subconscious and its influence on your perception of reality. So you can see who you are in relationship to the shifts on the surface of the intellect. So you can be a leader and learn to hear the hookum of your own soul. Because if you resist being a leader and hearing the hookum of your own soul, it creates a fundamental problem of responsibility. Blame and all of this. And whose responsibility is it to be a leader? To be you. You. Nobody else. You're going to have to, in my experience, have some kind of practice where you take the time to listen through the noise. That's the main thing because there's so much noise. And this is the last point I'll make before we practice. Leaders come to see that leadership has nothing to do with success and failure, has nothing to do with loss and gain, and has everything to do with service and listening. That's it. The most challenging thing in yoga, <coughs> excuse me, is listening. Like listening to me right now. Good yeah. <laughs> listening to you. Listening through the noise of, you know, if, if everybody is just projecting and has no voice and you're supposed to hear who you are in relationship to that, that's tough, man. And we think like, oh, well, the meditation practice is just like a garnish to life. If you look at it from these, through these eyes, you see it's a priority. Because otherwise, it's like, I don't know who I am. If I don't do my sadhana for two weeks, it's, I'm already starting to go like, oh, uh, who am I? You know? There's nothing magic about the sadhana. It's the practice of listening. You know what life is like? Yogi Bhajan said this. Life without a daily sadhana, first thing in the morning, is 
willy-nilly, he called it. <laughs> and you experience that. Oh, I'm just sort of. And then you get into the conversations with people like, what's new? Oh, not much. How are you? Oh, I'm fine. Okay. All right. Well, what do you want to do? I don't know. I don't... That's willy-nilly. Oh, let's just sit here and watch TV and eat this food, and who cares what's happening? It's like, ah, no. I care. You got to care, man. We're handing over a world to kids right now where they're talking about arming teachers in the U.S. It's like, what the heck is going on, man? The patients have taken over the asylum. You know? You're going to have to be able to listen through this crap. Because we're the ones to make the shift. But it doesn't come through following something or becoming something. It comes from you, being you, really you. And listening through the noise, following the call of your higher self for the service of others. Sit tall, close your eyes. <clears throat> 